people that we've brought onto the podcast are de- are so deserving in their own right. Oh, thank you. You know, they they all vary, but they've all got a great story. And uh, and Mitch, you've got an amazing story. Um, when I first got involved with tournament fishing in the Keys, bone fishing was with Harry Spear. So I was with him for seven years, and the audience knows a little bit about my story because they've heard it before. But the very first, I don't know, I don't remember you in the in the spring fly in 19, 1996, but the fall fly in 1996, you were the chairman. Yes. And um, anyway, that was that was like my second tournament I ever fished. You were the chairman, and you were so gregarious. Uh, you've been an incredible bone fisherman your entire life. There's not very many people that have won bonefish tournaments in the fly, in the fly, invitational fly tournaments, which you've won the spring fly and the fall fly, but you won five red bone tournaments. Um, and your life in fishing is, is, is extremely prolific. Thank you. Um, th- let's start back at the beginning. I think most of us start uh, if in, in the world of fishing with our, with our fathers. Um, True in I my case I, also, yes. In your case too. So yes. tell me a little bit about that. So I grew up in North Miami Beach um, in the 70s uh, and 60s. And um, my dad, it was through my dad that I had my first introduction to fishing. Um, he would charter boats out of the castaways dock, not on a regular basis, but once in a while. There was a fleet of charter boats there and we'd go fish offshore. And um, there was also an old time guide that guided down out of Miami Marina, I think it was. His name was Captain George Jepson. I remember his name. And I remember fishing in the bay when I was about five years old. He had a very unique habit. Every time you put a shrimp on the hook, he always spit on it before you were allowed to cast it. So- Do you ever ask him about that? No, no, it's so long ago. I'm 64, it was a long time ago. <laughs> he wanted to make the shrimp smell even worse. Yeah, he chewed, toba- <laughs> he chewed tobacco and he spit on the shrimp. And, uh, and I remember catching groupers and snappers um, and jacks around Fisher Island uh, when I was about five or six years old. So my dad is the one that exposed me to fishing. And I I, I also remember riding my bike uh, first grade. I r- would ride my bike down to a little canal a couple blocks from the house and catch brim. And I remember the first time a bass tried to eat the brim off the hook. And I said, oh, this is pretty interesting. (laughs) Put that brim right out there and caught that bass. But there are so many people that have a relationship with fishing in their early years via their bicycle for transportation. Sure. I I did that. Steve Huff talks about that in Miami chasing snook. Uh, You did that. Yeah. Well, it's like the ultimate source of freedom at that age. Yeah. You know, no one's telling you what to do and. You have this bicycle, this mode of transportation. You can go anywhere. And and you could do that safely back in those days. Your parents weren't worried about if somebody was going to abduct you or anything mm-hmm. like that. North Miami, uh, what years are you talking here now? I'm talking like 1964, 65, wow. 66, a long time ago. What do you remember about Miami back then? Uh, I remember just it was it was not crowded. It was a sort of a neighbor, neighborly type of place. Mm-hmm. Um, you could go look at any canal, look down, you'd see bass, you'd see snook, you'd see tarpon. And uh, fishing was pretty easy and, and a lot of fun. And it was, for me, that was all there was. I I didn't really play with other kids that much. Um, I wasn't into sports that much. I just wanted to go fishing all the time. Peacock bass, they weren't in the canals no, at the time, right? No. What was that, no, late 80s? That was... Probably 80s, yes. Yeah. yeah. They're they're by my house right now. Do you yeah. remember the first time fishing uh, Biscayne Bay or Flamingo? I remember uh, fishing Biscayne Bay um, in the late 70s. Uh, I fished with a fellow by the name of Jimmy Allen. Um, and, you know, back then, um, depending upon where you lived, there was a tackle shop that all of the regulars would sort of congregate in. And my tackle shop was in a place, uh, North Miami Beach, called Uslan Rods. And they did custom rods. And all of the, I would say, better anglers, you know, regular guys that liked the light tackle fish, we all went to Uslan Rods and um, in that area. In Miami, there was there was other tackle stores that people went to, uh, Dude and Harry's and uh, uh, tackle world down in South Miami. Um, so I met 
a lot of people, but I was like the kid. I, there were people that I fished with that were 10, 15, 20 years older than me um, that I got to fish with because that was sort of the hangout. Uh, Bill Hempel, my lifelong friend, um, I wasn't even old enough to drive. He had a Challenger skiff, and he used to drive from North Miami Beach to Hollywood. I was 14 or 15 years old. He would pick me up. We'd go down to the bay, launch that Challenger, and go bone fishing. So uh, I remember fishing the bay back then. And I, I don't know if, uh, if what I'm going to say is 100% accurate, but one of my first people that I really loved to fish with was Mark Croca in the bay. And I don't think Mark fished the bay very much back then. He had a sea squirt, a little sea squirt skiff. Well, wasn't he based out of Fort Lauderdale? Well, so he was fishing, face, Mark, f- fishing up in that area. And, and I think also, too, Lake Worth. So he was fishing the ocean for permit. Well, Mark, Mark really fished um, in Ala Mirada quite a bit. Um, he had this little sea squirt, which was sort of a precursor to a flats boat. Right. Um, and, and I got friendly with Mark when I was working in Inverary. Mark was working at a, at a country club there. Mm-hmm. And um, we got friendly, and we ended up fishing the bay together. And I think it was one of the first times he ever fished the bay. It was wow. with me uh, back then. And I, I, I had a pretty good knowledge of the bay. And back then, uh, Andy, it was Frank Garisto, Floyd Landon, Bob Branham was just getting started as a guide. Uh, there was just a handful of bonefish guides that, that fished the bay. Bill you, Curtis, of course. Yeah. But you were on the ground floor with a lot of great captains that really became iconic fishermen, you know. It's true. Like yourself. But let's go back just a little bit. You, uh, I want to talk about your dad. Your dad yes. was an offshore guy. Yes. Um, and I think you made mention, we were talking about George Solly the other day from uh, from Chittam. He used to be an offshore captain. And he used to ran your, your dad's yeah, in, boat. In, in many, many years later, my dad became very successful. Um, and he had a sport fisherman, a, a 50-foot Choi Lee sport fish. And George was his captain Wow! for I, I several years. Yeah. What a small world. Yeah. Did you go offshore quite a bit with a your lot. dad? Yeah. Uh, our routine was from January to uh, May 1st. My dad would have the boats taken over to the Bahamas in Harbor Island. And we, my dad and I would fly over usually every Thursday morning. Uh, and we would fish over there till Sunday and fly back Sunday afternoon. Now... Now, my dad had that Choi Lee Sportfish, but he also had a motor yacht that we we lived on while we were there. So wow. we, I was very lucky. Um, what, did you, what did your dad do to make all this kind of money? He, he had a home warranty company, the second largest home warranty company in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the, um, toward the end, my dad actually had bought Jimmy Buffett's yacht, a 90-foot Choi Lee. Wow. So in the end, we had, it was Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous for a while. Wow. And I got to do... A lot of fishing offshore. And then when we'd come in, um, I had a Hell's Bay Marquesa built for the yacht. I put it in the water over there and I'd go bone fishing. So I really got to do a lot of different things over there. Quickly. Yes. Did, did you enjoy the offshore fishing as much as the inshore? I I enjoyed it more when I was younger. Yeah. But then when I got the bone fish bug, I didn't want to do anything else but bone fish. I really mm-hmm. just love bone fishing. But th- there were two things that I really enjoyed. Uh, bone fishing and and deep jigging, which was a, not the jigging deep jigging that we talk about today with metal jigs, but with with lead jigs, w- which would have a worm, a plastic worm attached to them, with very light tackle, ten pound spinning rods, fifteen pound plug casting rods during the time of the Metropolitan Miami Fishing Tournament. So I, I grew up doing that. I loved doing that. And then when I was in my early teens, I I got to go bone fishing. Actually. My 13th uh, birthday, my gift that I wanted was a bone fishing trip in Isla Mirada. And I got, I got to go bone fishing. That was the first time. With who? Uh, a guy. I think his name was Captain Buddy Pinder. I remember. I remember that name. He was from uh, the Bahamas. No, 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 I don't Buddy think Pinder. so. But the Pinder family. That, that's so a Bahamian he, family, yes. But is he part of that family? I don't think so. I don't think so. He was one of like the early... Bud and Mary guides mm-hmm. with a big Willie Roberts skiff. And I didn't catch one, but I remember seeing them. Uh, and that was my first time bone fishing. Was your dad uh, into tournaments at all? No. Just, he just like, was, he, was he gravitating more towards billfish, like sailfish, and, he, or he, just or deep dropping offshore? No, he did love to catch tuna and billfish. Uh-huh. So, so how, did you, how did you get 
involved with uh, because the Met in the early years, that was the tournament to be associated with. How did you get involved with tournament fishing? Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you. So growing up, I was raised by my grandparents mostly in Hollywood. And I didn't have any money for a boat or anything like that. So what I used to do on the weekends was I would go on the Sea Legs, which is a party boat that still exists in Dania. And I'd go on that party boat Saturday morning. And the captain of that boat, and I'm, this is when I was about maybe 11, 12 years old. The captain of that boat took, a, took, a, took me under his wing. His name was Captain Stan Pomeroy. And um, he taught me how to light tackle fish. And he was very good at it. He also taught me how to catch bottom fish, snappers and groupers conventionally. But he, he really taught me about light tackle fishing. And imagine you're on a party boat. There's 30 people lined up on the side of that boat. Well, you certainly couldn't try to light tackle fish over there. So what I used to do is I used to go on the stern in the corner on the, on the port side. And I would just sit there all day. And I would deep jig with regulation met tackle so that if I caught something, I could enter it in the Met. And all of my catches in the Met were from fishing on a party boat for several years. That's crazy. Well, here's, here's the interesting thing about that. I could only fish Sunday if I caught enough fish Saturday to pay for Sunday's trip. So I, you were a commercial fisherman at a young of, age. <laughs> I was sort of a commercial fisherman. And, and you know, back then when the boat came in, there were people lined up at the dock waiting to buy your fish. And um, I, I, I never missed a Sunday. Let's put it like that. I was pretty fortunate. Do you remember what fish you were selling? Yes. It was always mutton snapper, grouper, uh, kingfish. And, you and know, what would be a typical Saturday? How many fish would okay. you catch? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I would catch on a typical trip five to seven mutton snappers and a couple of groupers and maybe a couple of kingfish. I had more, I, I would have probably 20, 25% of the boats catch. And, and the other thing about that was there was a pool on the boat. Everybody put a dollar in. It was optional. Sure. And um, whoever caught the largest fish would win the pool. Well, typically a grouper would win that. So I, I would win it uh, on a fairly regular basis. How were you out fishing the others when they were fishing with bait? Pretty easily because a lot of them were tourists and, uh, you know, they just put a line out and mm -hmm. they weren't, they weren't actively engaged like I was when I was deep jigging. Um, so your dad got you started, but did you have a mentor? Because it's kind of interesting. You were saying in your younger years, you were, you were raised by your grandparents. Yes. Where were your parents? My, 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 so my dad was gone. My mom uh, was, you know, just a manicurist uh, getting by on her own in Hollywood. There wasn't enough room for all of us. I have, you know, two brothers and, and a sister. There wasn't enough room for all of us at my grandparents, so we were kind of spread out a little bit. Where'd your dad go? He was uh, away, as they say. What do you mean? Uh, he got in some trouble. Legally. Legally, you know, he got, he got in some trouble, and he was away, and uh, I didn't see him from the time I was about 11 years old till I was about 20 four years old we had wow. no no relationship uh, wh what kind of um legal issues did he have if you don't mind me asking you know uh i don't mind i i can't give you all the details because honestly i don't know really what it was but i know he was involved with a group in north miami beach and that group um i would i don't want to use the word mafia because i don't really think it's it's the same but he was involved with a group that did a lot of stuff uh and i'm not talking about Drug pushing? Dr dr drugs. No, I don't think it was drugs. I think in my dad's case, it was it involved bad checks and that kind of thing. But I, I honestly, I don't know the answer. Right. I know, he never wanted to talk about it once we re re resumed our relationship. But I can tell you that when we did resume our relationship, his last name and my last name were different. Hmm. So um, Did that hurt you at, at a young age, not having a father figure? It, it did, but I knew, you know, I knew before it all blew up that this, something was wrong. I, and, and, you know, I, I just knew there was something amiss with him. And uh, we just, we, we always had a difficult, even afterwards, we had good times, bad times, you know, it was never really smooth. It sounds like fishing was your anchor. It was. Possibly saved your life it was. In, in one way so, or another. So my grandparents raised, raised me, and uh, my grandfather was a bookie. <laughs> and, and he was a small-time bookie, but he was a bookie. 
So during football season, I didn't want to be in that house on Saturday or Sunday. What was it like? It was crazy. You know, he would, he wasn't very good at, at being a bookie. He, he was always too much on one side or the other. And I guess when he won, it was great. But when he lost, he lost a lot. So I didn't want to be home on, on during football season. So Was he screaming and yelling yes, and angry? Yes, yes, yes. All of the above. Yes. Wow. So your your childhood was very disruptive. It was disruptive, but my grandparents were wonderful, loving people, and um, they didn't have a lot, but they were always behind, mm-hmm. um, you know, us kids, and very good to my mother. And I, 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 I consider that they did a, a very good job with us. So, who was your fishing mentor? If you had okay, anybody? so so Stan Pomeroy when mm-hmm. I was on that party boat, right? And then later in life, it became my heroes, mainly Flip Pallet. Um, my heroes w- weren't football players. They were Flip Pallet, Al Fluger, Chico Fernandez, Norman Duncan. These were the guys that I aspired to be like. Were they hanging out in the, in the fly stores where you were gravitating to? Because I know that they all met. Um, yeah. Um, they were not where I was because mm-hmm. they all, all of those guys lived in South Miami and I lived in Hollywood. So, right. no. Um, I first met Flip at Uslan Rods the tackle shop I mentioned a few minutes ago, he came in with a fellow by the name of Marvin Levine, who uh, I know he's been mentioned on your podcast before. Marvin um, was very talented in uh, the retail industry, and I think he he actually did some of the interior decoration for the early Bass Pro Shops. And Marvin was also an unbelievable caster and tarpon fisherman. Marvin knew Flip. They both came into Uslan one day, and I was there, and I met flip that day was 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 did he was he famous at that time or was he just a really uh, invested with fishing you're talking about flip yeah flip was very well known at the time very well known as as an angler because he was winning the met and stuff or he wasn't or he wasn't was he well known he was doing um a lot of tarpon fishing uh-huh um i remember reading an article that he was considered to be the guy that was going to break the 200 pound mark at home Assassa. Um, it was either going to be him or Billy Pate, and there was a couple of other people mentioned. Um, he was not filming anything at the time. I think it was a little bit before that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my my pass with Flip crossed later in life, and uh, a few years later, and he became a very important part of my life. How did your paths cross later? So uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to the University of Miami. And Were I was, you a brainiac? No, I wasn't. I really wasn't. Um, but there was a handful of scholarships for Broward County students, and I got one of them and you were for smart. business. So you were a brainiac. I really wasn't. <laughs> I really wasn't. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, my classes were from 9 to 1. And then I had a job working at the Falls Shopping Center in South Miami, and I worked at a very high-end men's clothing store there. I had the greatest job and this is back in like 1980. That store back then had shirts for $300 and suits for $2,000. I mean, we were, I think we were catering mainly to the drug trade. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, from, from, from 10 to one, when I was in class, your dad's friends, do you no, recognize no, him when no. they came through the front door? No, I really, I really want to be clear about that. I yeah. don't think my dad yeah. was in any way uh, involved with any kind of drug thing. But, but um, anyway, from nine, from ten to one, that there was no salesman in the store, just the store manager. If anybody came in and bought anything, I got the commission on it. From two to nine, the, I was the salesperson. Anybody came in, I got the commission on. It. So I had a great job. I was and and it was an intimidating store. The door was closed. We didn't welcome people in. Just walk in. Um, so I just sat there and basically did my homework until somebody came through the door. And that might have only been one or two times wow. during my shift. Well, anyway, I was making six to $800 a week back then. How old were you then? 18, 19 wow. years. It was great. So Marvin Levine had a store in the same shopping center. And he called me one day and he said, hey, I want to go. I want you to come have lunch with me and Flip Pallet. So I did. Flip decided he was going to open an outdoor store in the same shopping center. And he needed somebody to work in the store that had some retail experience. 
I gave up that six to $800 a week to work for $5 an hour for Flip because I wanted to work for Flip. I, you know, this was like the greatest thing for me. And that was Wind River Rendezvous? Wind River Rendezvous, yes. And I was sort of the quasi store manager and we sold uh, outdoor clothing, a little bit of fly fishing, tackle, knives. Um, it was a cool store and it was a great job. And that's how I got to meet Flip and really get to know him. Interesting. I remember Flip, last time we saw him, he said Marvin. Mar- Marvin was his Marvin name? Levine. Yeah, he said Marvin was probably the greatest fisherman no one's ever known about. It's, it's, he was a tremendous fly caster. Yeah, really, really, really good. So um, that's, that's, you know, how I got to know Flip. And I, I have an interesting Flip story. I have a lot, but, but Bring it. one in particular. So, you know, after working there for a year or so, um, I was dating this really nice girl. And one day she came in uh, as my shift was, was ending and I introduced her to Flip. And they spent quite a bit of time talking. They actually knew, knew some people, um, mutual friends and whatnot. And um, the next day I come in and Flip said to me, um, Mitch, I want you to come in the stock room. I want to have a talk with you. Um, I said, okay. I, I think I had mentioned to Flip. I said, I think Flip, I said, I, I think she might be the one that I end up marrying. So he said, I, w- I want you to come in the stock room. I want to have a talk with you. So we go in the stock room and he sits me down and he goes, Mitch, I'll never forget this. He goes, Mitch, I want you to take your thumb and put it down on the spool and break her off. <laughs> and I was like, why? Mitch, she's a really nice, lovely girl and she'll make somebody a great wife but you're a sea Jew, she is a land Jew, <laughs> and the two do not mix. <laughs> and, and guess what? I married her. <laughs> and, and she was a- she, Are you she still was, happily married? She, no, no. She was and is a, a wonderful person, uh, but he was right. You know, I wanted to go fishing every weekend, and she wanted me home with the kids and Sunday brunch with their parents. And I just wanted to be fishing. How many years later did you 13, put, that, 13, put that thumb on the spool and I, break her I, off? I put my thumb on the spool and broke her off 13 years later. It was a, it was a mutual thing, but we're still very amicable and mm-hmm. we've had, you know, a pretty good relationship all these years. Any other great flip stories? Um, well, flip one time took me out frogging in the glades which i had never i'd never been on an airboat and i'd never gone frogging before and um he said i think you're really going to like this so we take his airboat and we go out on the trail i think it was or somewhere out that way and you know it was just getting dusk and there was a another fellow that had an airboat that knew flip his name his name was brooks muse um and he was a well-known light tackle angler back Mm -hmm. in those days so i knew of him Um, but I had never really met him before. And I remember him giving Flip a small hatchet before we left and launched the airboat. And I just remember thinking, yeah, I wonder what that's for. So we go out and, you know, Flip shows me how to handle a gig and, and, you know, it's dark and you got the light on over your head and you're looking for the two little eyes shining in the light and, you know, you're, you're gigging frogs. And, And it was fun. I was really having a great time. And next thing I know, you see these two eyes and they were like 12 or 13 inches apart. And I'm thinking, wow, that can't be, that can't be a frog. And he he shuts the airboat down for a minute and you take our earmuffs off and he goes, Mitch, you see that gator over there? Yep. He goes, I want to, I want to take that home. I want to eat that. Eat the tail. Yeah. I want to eat the tail. Okay. How are we going to do that? You're going to pick up that hatchet and you're going to hit it in the head. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, okay, how does that work? Well, I just I just became a land Jew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, he pulls up alongside this gator and I take that little hatchet out and I raise up my arm and it, the gator is just right alongside the boat. I mean, he's not moving. He's just there. And as hard as I can, I, I, I reach down and whack it in the head and that hatchet just bounced right off of it like it was nothing. He goes, Mitch, you really got to hit it hard. So again, boom, nothing. And he was still there. Still there, just kind of moved up, you know, wiggled up a few feet, flipped motors right up alongside. He goes, Mitch, you don't you don't understand. You really got to whack it. So as hard as I possibly could, I buried that hatchet. 
and your natural reaction is, okay, you lift up. Well, the the jaws are, are cracking and, and he's trying to bite me and I couldn't hold on to him. So I, I let him go and all I could see was this hatchet sticking out of the water and Swear. looked like a submarine you know, going away. So we tried to get it and I think it got away from us. <laughs> It's a good story, though. It really, That's a great story. A really good story. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the Met, because I think the Met at the time was the biggest term in South Florida, if I'm not mistaken, other than the, the Invitational uh, Tarpon Tournaments. Yep. Were the Bonefish around There was point? Bonefish Tournaments. It was Marathon Bonefish Tournament was around. Right, and that's still, the oldest that's still taking place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how, who, how did you get introduced to the, the, to the Met? Okay. Um, on Sundays, there was a fishing column in the Miami Herald. It was written by Jim Hardy. Um, there was also a boating column by Jim Martinoff, I think. Um, and they had the 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 um, leaders every Sunday listed in the Met. So you could see who was leading these various divisions. And I, you know, you got a beautiful citation if you if you had a fish that qualified. So um, now, you know, I'm in my, my teens, late, later teens, and now I really want to sort of expand and, and do better. And see how good you are, yeah. too. Yeah, so, so I was working at that time parking cars. I was a valet car parker at a condo in Hallandale, and I knew about Ralph Delph, and all I wanted to do was book a charter with Ralph Delph. So. I remember it was $125, which was like a super lot of money for me back then. And I saved up my money, and I booked my first charter with Ralph Delph. In, in Key West? In Key West. He had a 20-foot sea craft. And, um, you know, he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to enter some fish in the Met. Well, what would you like to catch? I said, well, I, I understand, you know, I could catch an amberjack on, on the fly rod. I had a 12-weight fly rod. So, you know, they they set me up with that at Usland. I was all set. So, uh Let's let's you know try to catch an amberjack, maybe a cobia, and see how the day goes. So he runs out in the Gulf, and we get to this wreck uh, called the Tug, which is in like I think it was in about twenty five feet of water. You could barely see something down there on the bottom, but crazy. He anchors the boat before the anchor line even came tight. These amberjack and cobia are coming up to the boat. They they were very familiar with Ralph Delf. <laughs> so he had a live well full of blue runners. He took a blue runner and he put it on a, a boat rod and he just. Without just, a hook. That's a no, boat it, rod. No, it had a hook. Okay. It had a hook on it. But it, I think the point was broken off. So what something. does a boat rod mean? A conventional, like a 4-0 trolling rod. Okay. Like a trolling rod. Uh -huh. So he's just holding it alongside the boat. And I'm standing there and I'm stripping fly line off my fly reel. And he goes, well, what are you doing? I go, I'm getting ready to make cast. He goes, no, 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 no. Reel all that up until there's about eight inches of line from the tip of your rod to the popper. And when I tell you, just drop the popper in the water next to the boat. There was no casting. Anybody could have done it. And here are these amberjack, 40, 50 pounds, trying to eat this blue runner three feet next to the boat as if the boat wasn't even there. There was an amberjack there that was huge. And I remember Ralph saying to me, you can catch any amberjack, but not that one. <laughs> and I said, why, what's the matter with that one? I'm saving that one for Jim Anson. Now, Jim Anson was one of Ralph's regular customers. He was he, I, he was either won the Met or was always leading. So he said, don't catch that one. That's Jim's fish. Really? So he wouldn't let me catch that one. Wow. That, that's a testament to how good Ralph Delph was. He, he was amazing. So those Amberjack are you know, going crazy, and he lets the anchor line go, and it's got a float on it. And now we're drifting away from the wreck, which you know, Ralph – he could figure out how to catch anything on anything. Once we got a good ways away from the wreck, he said, okay, drop your popper in the water. Don't cast, just drop it. Boom, 49 pound amberjack on fly, my first one. That was like my first fly rod fish. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty so amazing. So if I'm not mistaken, he was trying to chum that Jeez. amberjack away, away from the wreck yeah. so he wouldn't pull you down and, and pull break me you back. off. Yeah. yeah. So I, I did catch that amberjack and then I went on to catch several cobia that day and um, he went to another wreck and I caught big mangrove snappers on fly. I caught like six or eight different species that day that I entered. So you went from a jig fisherman to a fly rod guy. That's How yeah. did that transition take place? Um, uh, very difficultly. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know how to cast. 
Um, I didn't really have anybody really teaching me how to cast. Um, so it, it took quite a while. I'm still, I don't consider myself to be a, a good caster. I think I'm, I think I can get it out there. Mm -hmm. And I think li like Flip says, it's not beautiful, but it gets the job done. Sure. You know? But that's it, more important anyway. Any great fisherman has a connection with fish and know, and they know how to make the fish bite your bug. Yeah. And I, and I, I think you're a hundred percent right about that. Um, you know how to get that tarpon to eat that fly. And I think that's, you can get it out there, but you've got to do something with it once it gets there mm -hmm. and make it work. You know how to do that. Tim Mahaffey, one of the greatest bone, maybe the greatest bone fisherman I know of, he knows how to make that happen. But you know how to make I, I that do. happen too. I, I do. I do. Yes. Was there a fly fishing mentor? I mean, did Flip help you with that? He did help me. Yes. But that was, I was already pretty into it at that point, uh -huh. you know, um, but I was mainly into doing it offshore and then you know dolphin are pretty easy to catch on so fly. chumming up offshore fish and then you throw your fly yes in there. yes right. now when i was about 16 years old my grandfather bought me a little boat it was not a he thought it was a fishing boat because the model was called the fisherman but it was actually a a cathedral hall windshield walk through the windshield type of boat and i used to take that out and i i would learn you know how to catch different fish on on fly out there mm -hmm. barracudas were were not hard to catch big barracudas mm -hmm. um and then i decided i'm going to take that boat bone fishing so i got a copy of Stu app's guide to fishing in the florida keys have you ever seen it it's a little paper pamphlet book it was like from the 70s and it actually had little maps in there on where where you could find bonefish. I think fish. everybody was pretty mad at Stu at the time Probably. because he was telling everybody where yeah. to go fishing. Guilty as charged. I wasn't mad. I was happy because <laughs> I didn't know where to go. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I trailered that boat down to Key Largo because it was close. And I put it in and I went to a couple of places where there was a picture of the bonefish on the shoreline. With an X. No, there was a bonefish. Oh, bone there was a bonefish. Like he, had, he had a picture of a bonefish where there were bonefish. He had tarpon where there were tarpon. Anyway, um, I went in there and I didn't have a push pole. I had a wooden uh, a clothesline dowel and I pulled with that dowel this cathedral hull boat and I saw, my God, there's tailing bonefish. That's, those are bonefish. And that was like, boy, now I got to get something other than this boat. I got to get a, uh, some kind of boat that I can actually flats fish with. So, um, for for not a lot of money back then, you could get a Starcraft aluminum boat. And a lot of guys were, were getting those. Mm -hmm. And you could sort of reconfigure it to make a bow platform and a stern platform. You didn't have a polling platform back then. So I sold that boat my grandfather got me. I got the Starcraft. And now I had a real true polling flats type boat. And I started running from Crandon Park all the way down to Key Largo in the bay, and I learned the bay, and I learned Key Largo pretty well. Um, what was the fishing like back then? Andy, back then, you could pull up to a flat, and as far as you could see, there'd be one tailing there, two tailing there. It just as you could see your next 10 shots, there were so many bonefish in the bay. Um, if you were there on a low fall or a low incoming, it was just unbelievable. And I, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't very good at fly fishing, um, but I certainly knew how to catch them on shrimp and, and jigs, especially. Mm -hmm. I really got into catching them on jigs, so I didn't want to have to buy shrimp. So um, I, I really was catching quite a few with the jig. And I've never f jig fished, I think a couple of times with Harry and the Bay Bone. So Bokar was like sight fishing, yep. and I was throwing my jig kind of offshore in deeper water and just kind of yep, jigging. Blind jigging. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I won. I won many red bones by catching fish on just a blind cast. Yeah. Did you have like the underhand splashless cast down at the time? No, I don't. Have, did I didn't have it then. I don't have it now. You probably <laughs> didn't need it. You didn't need it, uh, Nikki. Um, no, Richard Black. Is, he's the greatest. When it, him and Mark Croker, they are amazing. Yeah. When it comes to putting it in the water without a splash, it's crazy. Yeah. They fling it sideways and flip that that rod tip underneath. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, kind of like a flip underhand cast. So yep. the fly comes under. Yeah. Yeah, but it's amazing and, and how fly they... rod too. You can do it with the fly rod too. You flip it like this, and so the fly comes under the fly line. Right. And so it just kind of it comes it gets, and just it gets just, laid out yeah. there. But you have a heavy jig, and it's like I've seen croca, you know, and and you know all about all this. Just sure. 
and it's like a teardrop. Yep. But it's a heavy weighted jig. Yep. So, you know, the jig thing for me was a big deal because when I started fishing tournaments, you got more points for catching a bonefish on a jig versus a shrimp. So I used jigs a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when weather conditions were poor and you couldn't see, you could still throw that jig and catch two or three fish during the course of a day. Blind casting. Just blind casting. And that gave me an edge. Mm -hmm. So I utilized that quite a bit. Let's go back to Ralph Delft because Mm -hmm. probably one of the greatest names in in all of fishing. Yeah. Especially in Florida, Southwest, and light tackle fishermen. But he could also do it on fly and I think he chased world records on fly as a guy did. as well. Yeah. Um, talk to me about his greatness. He, uh, I fished with him, not a, not a lot because I just really couldn't afford it. But I probably did at least ten trips with him, and um, he was incredible in figuring out how to catch what you would think would be an uncatchable fish on that tackle, like. One of the fish that I loved to catch when I was deep jigging was I always tried to catch a big black grouper on very light tackle. I'm talking about 40, 50 pound fish on 10 pound spinning rod or a 15 pound plug casting rod on an artificial jig, not no bait. And, you know, you would think immediately like, you know, if you go up on top of the reef in 190 feet of water, you know, the black groupers live there, but you can't catch them there on light tackle. There's too much stuff for them to go in. So Ralph would figure out little tiny spots out in 200 feet of water, 180 feet of water, 240 feet of water, where there wasn't much out there, but there was a few groupers. And you'd go out to a place like that, and you could catch. I caught a 53-pound black grouper on 15-pound test plug casting tackle. That's basically a bass fishing rod. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 53-pound. Yeah, that was my best one. I, I mean, I lost ones that were probably bigger. Did so, they have sonar back then? He he did. Um, and Ralph had an Ralph had a pretty hot temper. I remember on one trip, you know, back then we didn't have the GPS like we have today. And Ralph used to run time and distance. Mm-hmm. So you'd leave the dock, he'd run at a certain RPM, a certain compass heading, and after 45 minutes, you were pretty close to the spot. And then he'd pick it up on his depth sounder. Well, one time about Three quarters of the way to where we were going, his his clock, his stopwatch or whatever he had, it 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 just blew up, and he just threw that thing on the deck. He was just pissed. We still found the wreck we were looking for, but I remember him really being pissed. Well, Lisa wasn't because he stopped, and, and Lisa wasn't because he had to go to the bathroom. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. No, and he taught me. You know, he taught me a lot of very valuable things that people wouldn't really think about. Like, for example, if you're close to a wreck and you really can't find the wreck, look for a sea turtle because sea turtles love to live on wrecks. Mm -hmm. And that has served me well many, many times over the years. Do you ever talk about birds? I don't recall that Mm -hmm. much, but we didn't do that. You know, we weren't dolphin fishing or really sail fishing. Um, We were mostly, you know, deep jigging or fly fishing over wrecks and things like that. So he helped you in the Met. No, uh, he, well, yes, yes, I did. I did. Um, I, I won a grouper division with him. Um, I don't really remember. I got, I got quite a few citations in my garage, but I don't remember, you know, what all of them were African pompano and things like that, groupers mm-hmm. and mutton snappers. Before we sat down, you were talking about how braid really changed the game. Yes. So Talk, it, yeah, it, talked about that. Yeah. So it's my belief that, that two things really changed in South Florida. The Met went away. And that whole um, group of anglers that like to, to f- enter fish in the Met and fish according to Met standards, like you would fish IGFA standards mm-hmm. today, and braided fishing line. When braided fishing line um, came on the, on the horizon and became more popular, you know, you could use 10 pound braid, but it was really like using 16 or 17 pound mono. There wasn't the same. Um, sport in it, in my opinion. And braid is very abrasion resistant. You hook a bonefish or a permit and it goes around the mangroves with mono. If you're not super careful, you're going to break them off. With braid, you, you you can land them. I mean, they, they you know, you just kind of work your way around it and it doesn't seem to hurt it. So I True. think braid allowed people to catch fish that were 
maybe not as catchable. And it, it sort of helped real true light tackle fishing in South Florida kind of fade away a bit. Mm-hmm. Well, it also affected the offshore people because monofilament going through the, the water had so much drag. And when these guys started using um, gel spun type of stuff, uh, it would pierce through the water so much so much easier. Yep, yep. And and Rob Fordyce is the guy that really introduced me to braid. We were um, fishing together, and I had brought my spinning rods, and he had a rod with braid on it. It was the first time I ever picked up a rod with braid, and he says, Mitch, just cast that rod right there. And I made one cast, and my cast was 25 feet longer. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, my God. He goes, it's game-changing. Mm-hmm. And he was right. But when you talk to Crocum, when you're bait fishing for tarpon, he says the fish will go around that braid. I think so, he's probably so right. So mono. Yeah. He, he's, he's always stayed with mono. And he and when I fished with Mark, you know, I did win, um, I think it was the fall fly with Mark. Um, he always insisted that I use an, a, a, a monic line, you know, a clear line. And, I, and he thought that, that in a three-day tournament – that a monic line was good for an extra fish or two that you maybe wouldn't have caught otherwise. Right, and and that's what he and uh, Mahaffey did. Mahaffey used well before anyone else was using a clear fly line. Yeah, but I I found that too, like in the Bahamas where you're fishing for big schools of fish, and, and I really haven't done a whole lot of bone fishing with clear fly line, but I just tried it one time, and I I noticed I think maybe in Venezuela too at Las Rocas, if you have a school of bone fish come come at your fly. With a colored fly line, you've got to catch that lead fish. Yes. And if you've got an all clear fly line, you can catch the fish that are in the back of That's the school right. because they slide right by it. Yes. You don't see it as well. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. It's, uh, you know, I think those lines are a little harder to handle, but I absolutely do agree that, you know, in, in a tournament situation, they give you an edge for mm-hmm. sure. And the tarpon, tarpon tournaments too, you know, uh, that's that really became prevalent, you know. But the problem is, I mean, you can see your fly, but to the person who doesn't fish an all-clear fly line very often, yeah. they lose that fly That's and then they sure. lose the relationship of where you are with the fish. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you've won, I think you're, you know, you're saying, me, you know, telling me five red bones, You the this, this spring fly bonefish and the fall fly bonefish. Are you the only person that have, that have won uh Terms with a spinning rod and a fly rod in the red bone series or or look you've won the fly bonefish tournament in the in in the fall too yes that's really hard to do with a fly rod well but, you, yeah i mean but, those that that's the hardest tournament i those are were the hardest tournaments those are the, the invitationals but you won both the spring and the fall mm-hmm. but you also won you know terms with a spinning rod yes are you the only one that has won on both uh, I, sides? I don't know that I'm the only one, but I, I would just say that that's attributable to the fact that because of my formative years of fishing mm-hmm. using all different types of tackle, I was very comfortable picking up any a plug rod, a spinning rod, a fly rod. It didn't matter. I was comfortable. Right. If the conditions warranted a fly rod, I, I used it. If not, I would use something else. Yeah. A spinning rod. The I mean, bush, your, vers- yeah, your versatility jo- is, is incredible. Yeah, I was... I was very comfortable with all of those. Mm-hmm. So you started getting better at bone fishing. At one, po- at what point did you start to think, let's start entering some tournaments and see how good I am? Well, so here's what happened. Um, the very first red bone tournament, which was the first ter- real tournament, not the Met, real tournament I, I ever fished. Um, I called John Donnell and I, I said, John, I don't know if you're aware there's going to be this tournament. It's a two-day tournament. John was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. He wasn't in the Keys. It's bonefish and redfish. I said, why don't we do that? So he, he's like, yeah, 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 Mitch. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. You know, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So um, I think uh, it was run out of Plantation Yacht Harbor, which is now called the um, Founders Park. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, was that the Bay Bone? No, it was it the very first Red Bone. Red there bone. was no Bay Bone okay. at that time. And it was just a two-day tournament, Saturday and Sunday. Fly, spin, that was it. So uh, they paired you with a celebrity. And um, my first day, I was paired with a NBC news anchor named John Palmer. Very nice guy. Wasn't, you know, 
real proficient, but but a nice guy to mm-hmm. be in the boat with. And you know, he he knew how to fish, but he wasn't you know he wasn't used to saltwater flats fishing. And um, I would give him the first shot. You know, a bonefish popped up. I'd give him the first shot because our plan was we're going to bonefish Saturday, we're going to redfish Sunday. So. Um, I knew Key Largo pretty well, and I said to John, I, I think there's, we can definitely catch a lot of fish in Key Largo. So uh, we went up there. I gave John every first shot, and if he made a bad cast, I used just the jig. I didn't use shrimp. And at the end of the day, we come in, and we're, we're leading the tournament. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's a pretty amazing feeling. We got a shot at this. Well, day two, guess who I was paired with? Billy Pate. What an honor. You know, I knew Billy Pate, but I didn't. I've never had fish with him before. So we um, we run over to Flamingo. Uh, let me backstory real quick. So that's that's Saturday. We're in first place. John and I are staying at Plantation Yacht Harbor. There was a little motel there, and it's like you know we had dinner, and it's like eight o'clock, and I'm like get ready to turn in, and John's getting ready to go out, and I'm John. What are you going to do? Oh, I got this girl and, you know, I, 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 you know, got a pretty good shot at having some fun tonight. John, John, we got to get up real. No, but don't worry, Mitch. I'll be back. Don't worry. So, so, <laughs> so it's good. I think he stumbled in around 4 a.m. the next morning and uh, we got Billy Pate. We left the dock. We get about halfway across to Flamingo and the motor just starts cutting out on the boat. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose this tournament because this motor is dying. So he, him and Billy are trying to get the motor running. I didn't, I can't, still can't fix anything. And he says to me, uh, Mitch, go in my console and pull out my toolbox. So I pull out the toolbox and uh, I empty all the salt water out of it. And I try to find <laughs> <laughs> whatever type of wrench he wanted. And somehow, some way they got that motor running. And we ran over to Flamingo and we caught redfish and, and I ended up winning the red bone first time. Wow. And I was so excited and i just couldn't believe that and and i think we actually won it by quite a bit so i'm like wow i must be getting pretty good at this um a, a side note to that was the um the host of the red bone i don't know if it was the first year or the second year but was he was kurt gowdy was the host mm-hmm. and um one of my clients a very gregarious woman she got to talking to kurt and kurt she introduced me to kurt and Kurt became a wonderful friend. He became a client of mine for many, many years. And I'm still very friendly with the Gowdy family to this day. Mm-hmm. So I, I, a lot of- You, you talk know, about an iconic celebrity in the Oh, outdoor. yeah. Oh. He, was, he was just such a great guy to mm-hmm. be in. I used to take him fishing all the time. Um, and, and we became great friends. Um, he, he was just a wonderful guy to be in the boat with. Mm-hmm. He, did he yeah. have the first outdoor kind of fishing The American show? Sportsman. Yeah. That was the first one, right? I the, think it was. The very yeah. first. And and his show not only covered fishing, but hunting. And it was right. all related to celebrities. Yes. Celebrities fishing, celebrities hunting. Yes. And then from there, it kind of, you know, there were a number of other shows that did that. But he, as it turned out, I think he ended up in like 26 Hall of Fames. I believe it well. My my wife and I went to his house one time in Palm Beach, uh, not a house, a mansion. And, you know, I don't know uh, people realize it, but Kurt also owned a bunch of radio stations. And he made a, a bulk of his money by owning radio stations. Wow. So we went to this mansion on Palm Beach that he had. And um, his lovely wife, Jerry, was was showing us around. And my my wife, Gilda, who's very outgoing, she goes, oh, my God, is that an Emmy? And there was an Emmy, and she got to pick it up and hold it, and it was like, ah, oh, she was so excited. That was sitting right next to about thirty others. He, yeah, he had a whole, he had his own little man cave there, and it was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you won all these bonefish tournaments. What's the what's the tournament that's most meaningful to you? What was your greatest Def- one? Definitely, it was either the fall or the spring fly, because I I really feel, and and you know this better than anybody, Andy. Those big Isla Mirada fish were the hardest fish to get to bite. I mean, they were constantly hammered. They'd seen everything. You know, Jim Bocor knew how to get it done with a crab. Mm -hmm. Um, But to get one on fly, one of those 11, 12, I mean, you got two huge ones one morning, I remember. The the fall fly that you hosted. Yeah. You had two big big fish like in the first hour or so. First 30 minutes. Yeah. 
my very first cast, I caught a 1010. And as we're that pulling, was with Harry, right? That was with Harry. Yeah, yeah. We we're pulling off at the shell, shell key edge there. Harry said, "If uh, something like if this were if this is if this going to be if this were uh, if this were a perfect day, we'd catch a a twelve pound fish before we get to that channel." And I looked over to the the side there, and there's there's two big bonefish tailing. We went over and cut a thirteen twelve. Yeah, I remember that in the first thirty minutes. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And you were you were the chairman of that tournament. Yeah, but, I think I was chairman with Patrick Dorsey. I think one year we were both mm-hmm. doing it. Um, but yeah. that was that was um, Jurassic Park for the world of bone fishing. It really for years and years really and years. was. And 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 I'd like to tell a, a quick story yeah, about that. Yeah, of course. So in April of 2011, I had just gotten this new little skiff. It was a, a 14 foot little little skiff, a, a replica of what used to be called the Fibercraft bonefish skiff. And it was sort of like a novelty, mm-hmm. but um, I just got that boat, and I, I called my friend Chris Gutierrez, uh, and I said, you know, let's let's take it down to Alamrata and just break it in down there, and you know, you got to idle the first hour anyway, so we could just fish downtown. So um, we didn't have any fly rods; we had one spinning rod. I got some shrimp. We put in at the little tea table, crappy ramp there, and we putt putted out. Oh, towards Shell, but in between Shell and Lignum Vitae, I think there's this little place there called Billy's Lake. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, po- I, I get up on the tower and I take a couple strokes of the pole and I see two fish tailing on the edge. I said, Chris, those are big fish. So he made one cast. He hooks this fish. It runs into the basin and it's fighting. And I, you know, I caught a few big ones by then, so I knew it was a big, big bonefish. And it gets it up and it's the biggest bonefish I've ever seen in my life. And I, I, I didn't have any way to put it in a well, bring it in alive. So I was very careful about measuring it. And that fish was 37 inches to the fork and had a 20-inch girth. So we released that fish. And we're, oh, I took pictures of it and I just couldn't be happy. That was like world record stuff. So, so now it's my turn to fish. Chris goes up on the back of the tower and pushes a little bit. And here's two more fish tailing. I make one cast. I hook this one fish and it does the same thing, but it's, it's really, really dogging it out. And it's like 35 minute fight. I mean, I think we were using either six or eight pound and I get that fish in and we measure it. It's exactly the same size as the first fish. Wow. Like, how does that happen? I mean, we were so careful and I took so many pictures because I, I had seen big bone fish from being in the tournaments, but I'd never seen one this Never seen two this size. 37 to the fork, 20-inch girth. That's yep. so, crazy So big. Michael Larkin, who was at that time doing a lot of studies on bonefish for the University of Miami, I had his number in my phone from the bonefish tournaments. I called him and I said, I got these measurements. I need to know how much do you think these fish weighed? And he said between 16.1 and 16.4. So I've never seen one bigger. But the length, the 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 length... And or, the, or the girth squared times the length divided by 800. We just did that. That came out to 18 and a half. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was happy with 16. <laughs> Why? Tell me Tell me about those big fish um, and, and the key to catching them, because you refined uh, that art form. Well, um, I, I would say that Mark Croca had it down really, really well. Um, and he and he would show me things like when we were fishing and, and he'd go, watch, as we get up closer to that fish, you're going to see, even though I'm polling deathly quiet and he really slowed down and was super careful about putting the pole in the bottom, he'd say, he'd say watch, you're going to see its behavior change. And, and it would it would have been tailing beautifully. All of a sudden, the tail would go down and you would see it wouldn't tail again. Or it would stiffen. Yep. Yep. Because if they're you, flickering like this, yep. and all of a sudden they get they yeah. get they're, wary, they're, they're like a deer in the you know like on high alert now. That mm. tail stiffens up. Yeah. So so Mark really would, you know, tell me, okay, now now make your cast now, and and I think those fish tolerated no mistakes. You mm-hmm. just could you had to be like, and I think this is also a Mark saying. He says it can't be on the dining room. It's got to be on the dinner plate. Mm, that's a good saying. Yeah, At the presentation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Were you always casting when the fish was was was? We tried to. He would. So if he was tailing, if he was digging, the head that down. Was, that was the time the, you want that you fly. Put the fly in there. Yes. He, he opens. Yeah. He just tips up, and there. And there it is. it is. Yes. Yes. Were you fishing any kind of a fly that would land a little bit softer in any way? 
would depend on the conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, you wanted it, you didn't want it to be flat, calm, and still. That was no. like, forget it. The harder it, it blew, the better oh, you could catch if them. If it would blow 25, that was the day you were going to catch the big ones. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice that if you were fishing a, a crab fly, you could not bump it? You had to just slide it? Yes. The biggest one I ever caught on fly, which was 13 4 with Mark in that tournament, that's exactly how I did it. Mm -hmm. I remember it very well. And, uh, those those fish were just. I think the hardest quarry you could get was those big Alamorada downtown fish. You know, I've always agreed with with uh, I think Steve Huff would say, look, a permit is not fair. You can make a perfect cast and you can't get a permit. He'd say Tar it's not. He'd say it's not honest. Even. It's not it's an not honest, honest fish. Yeah, right. tarpon were easy, but if you could catch a really big, really big bonefish. That that was um, that was a like a, a sign or the green light that you had made it. Yeah. If you could consistently catch big big bonefish, you could catch anything. Yeah. But you know, it was also very important in those tournaments once you had the weight fish to get the releases because mm -hmm. they just you know when you had the weight fish now you got to be able to rack up points with releases so right. back then those those were fish under eight pounds it was confirmation this is where i was thinking yeah, of. confirmation, was confirmation exactly. that you'd made it as, yes. a, as a great angler yes why why did you like bonefish so much and you never i never saw you in, in the tarpon tournaments well first of all most of the tarpon tournaments were five days i couldn't take five days off you know of work to do a tarpon tournament uh, bonefish tournaments were three days and I, I, I love tarpon fishing, and I, I still to this day enjoy it very much. But I always felt that bonefish were somehow, and I, it's a weird word to use with bonefish, but to me they're more of an elegant fish. Sure. You know? And, yeah, I get that. And it's I, like Kevin Guerin said, you don't see bonefish hanging out at feeding docks. Like you it, don't. Like it, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. It's Permit true. too. It's true. It's true. So um, bone and bone fishing was, you know, for the most part, not maybe not year round, but a nine month thing where you could go out and, and find them. You're not going to find many giant tarpon, you know, in the middle of uh, February unless it's flat ass calm. Right. I think there's also something to be said about fishing in a foot of water. Yep. And it's all visual. Yeah. I I, I was telling Nikki, and, and I've made this comment before. If I were to catch, I've had one, if I had one last fish to catch, it'd probably be waiting for a big 13, 14 pound tailing bonefish somewhere. Yeah. It's so organic. You know, it's just you, the fish, shallow water, the sea breeze. Yeah. The, you know, I mean, I just, I just love that scenario where it's just you and the fish. There's no boat, there's no speaking. Right. And they pull hard, and you're not going to, for the most part, you're not going to have an hour fight. No, you're not, but it's going to be an unbelievable first and second run. You're not going to forget those runs on those big ones. They they do fight differently than the smaller ones. Well, I've noticed that a little bonefish, he'll go out and he comes back about yeah. halfway. He goes out, comes back yeah. halfway. But a big bonefish, at the end of that first run, he goes left or right. Yep. Do you agree? And you can, yes, I do agree. And then also, you can get him three quarters of the way back to the boat and then another big run again. And, you know, um, in the downtown area when those fish were fairly prevalent, you know, during lobster or stone crab season, you had to contend with those fish running off the flat, getting in a channel, getting, I lost a big one with Mark around a, uh, a lobster trap. Yeah. Yeah. They're um, smart. Yeah. So yeah, you, 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 before we sat down, you talked about all the great guys you fished with, Bob Branham, John mm -hmm. Donnell, Tim Klein, you know, Richard Black, Croca. Mm -hmm. Who's the best guy? I, I was afraid you might ask me that question. I think it depends on what you're doing and where you are. Um, in Flamingo, it's, you know, Dave Denkert, Richard Black. You, I don't think you could get any better. Um, in the immediate downtown Isla Mirada area, if you want to catch a Grand Slam, there's only one name on that list that's going to get that done on a regular basis, and that's Mark Croca. He, he's amazing. Um, I, I've got to say, of, of all the guides I fished with, the one that I've had the most fun with, and I just love fishing with, even though he's retired now, is Bob Branham. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get off the boat at the end of the day, and I got a stomach ache from laughing all day long. He just he just giggles. Yeah, he's just he's just so much. So, it's just a gregarious, fun guy to be in the boat with all day. Mark in a tournament, 
is a super, super serious. Like if you make a bad cast, he would say something like, well, no big deal. It's just a tournament. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's really sarcastic, isn't oh, yeah. he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I, if I had a bad day, I'd get off the boat and I'd feel like I was about, you know, one inch tall. <laughs> but he, you know, he made you a better angler. And I think a good guide will, can make you a much better angler. Mm-hmm. And I... He I'm demands a, perfection. Yes. And, and um, I mean, um, you know, the the, the top guides... They see what they have to work with, and and they work on making you better. Mm-hmm. And and you know, I do believe at the end of the day, you should walk off the boat and feel like you had a good time. It should be fun. But I also love the fact that these guides have had a meaningful impact on my abilities as an angler over the years. Would you agree oh, with that? Oh, absolutely. You're not going to get to uh, the end of the rainbow with a guide that's not demanding or a guy that's not very good. Yeah, yeah. What's the commonality between all these great guides? I think that they have this professionalism professionalism about their job and they want to be the best like in any career they want to mm. be the best in in their field and I think they go the extra step. I mean if you fish with Richard Black when Richard leaves the dock that morning his whole day is planned out in his head. It may have been planned out a week before. Mm-hmm. He knows looks at the tide, looks at the weather, he does his homework. He pre-fishes the area. He he is so methodical. Um, and I think he's, if not the best, one of the top three guides in the Keys right now. Up and co- He's not an up-and-comer. He's an established guide. Mm-hmm. He's he's as good as it gets right now. It, but it's amazing how young he is. Yes, but he has. And he looks even younger. He, he yeah. sure does. <laughs> but, you know, um, my, my sister-in-law and uh, her friend Cindy uh, fished with him in the Widom tournament last year for the first time. And and as intense and as good as Richard is, they got off the boat at the end of the day. They had a wonderful time. They mm-hmm. just had fun. He impressed them. They caught fish. They just had a great, great day with him. So mm-hmm. and they're, you know, they're experienced, but they're, you know, they're not professional mm-hmm. anglers. I think I think a, a big common thing that a lot of great anglers and guides have is they know they know that their their quarry. Yep. When they see that fish, they know what that fish is doing. Like Mark said, you know, you watch. Pull, yeah, yeah, watch, watch. So he knows, yep. and you know how to feed them. They yep. know how they react. Yeah. And a lot of people think that, well, I got to get better, and they go to the park and they practice casting, but they don't know how to identify what they're doing wrong. They don't know how to how to be, you know, uh, the, the techniques and 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 the dynamics of casting but more importantly than anything like you said I might not have been the best caster but Mark taught you how to catch fish yes he did he taught you what to look for yep and that's what Harry did to me he would say okay watch you know don't slide direct. so right. it's like in tarpon fishing and bone fishing too if you want to put get the fly into place let's just say you're a little bit long yep you don't strip it into place fish don't like that fly jumping no so you sweep the rod tip, yep, and then you start your feed. Like I remember Mark pointing out to me, he goes, "You know, when you when you make your cast, mentally remember that you're planted in the boat. Don't make the boat move. Don't make the boat shift we'll from rock. side to side. And all of these little things make a huge difference when mm-hmm. you're fishing for a twelve pound bonefish. Mm-hmm. You and wouldn't think rocking in a boat when you're casting, huge, sh- shifting your your weight." That that pressure moves. Abs- they know, they feel it. They definitely feel it for mm-hmm. sure. Um, Mark Mark is just uh, f- incredible. Just incredible. Did you ever practice spin fishing, um, casting off the water, like into five gallon buckets or? No, I the, I never did that in the park uh, or no, somewhere. No, I just always did it off the boat. Um, I did that with fly casting when I started early on. You know, I would go down the street and get to the park and just make some casts because right. I didn't really know what I was doing at all. Right. But not with spin fishing. Yeah. Um, yeah, with spin fishing, I, because I started spin fishing and I always used a jig and I I, I was pretty- Came natural. Yeah, it yeah. did. It did. Who, but was, who was the biggest yeller? Yeller? <laughs> uh, definitely Dave. Dave Denkert. I heard he, he's, <laughs> he, he's brutal. He, he He's not brutal, but but um, he, he lets you know when- you know, Mitch, you know, pull left, pull right, you know, 
<laughs> why faster? So what I do with Dave, and I fish with Dave, you know, uh, fairly regularly. Uh, I always during the day, at some point, I say, "Okay, Dave, I want you up on the bow. I'm going to pull for a little while. I feel like pulling." And I just hammer him, <laughs> hammer him. Dave, is there really one over there? I didn't see that one over there, Dave. <laughs> Dave, that's the wrong end of the fish. <laughs> and, and Dave says, "I don't yell. I just, I just, we just have a loud conversation." <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, but you gravitated, I think, to a bay boat, didn't you? No, I, I have three skiffs right now. So when you were jigging, because I, I remember you were talking about how you were just floating around. Slow pitch jigging, you liked. Not not slow pitch jigging. No. You're talking about offshore now, yeah. right? Yeah. No, no, it was always deep jigging. It's not the jigging that, that people do today with mm. these really limber rods and metal jigs. Mm-hmm. This is um, this is a three to four, two to four ounce white jig with a with a plastic worm on the end of it. And, you know, you truly had to manipulate that jig well to be able to get a decent sized mutton snapper to eat it. I mean, a, a mutton snapper's not a dumb fish either. Mm-hmm. So you would, you would anchor your flat skiff out there? No, I would just take it out there. And I had a little depth sounder on my Marquesa. And I, I had places, you know, for the last 30 years that I've been fishing out of Key Largo mostly. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, go out there and jig when it's a nice day. Because I remember I saw you. I hadn't seen you in a, in a, long, a long while. I said, what are you up to? He said, man, I'm catching these great fish jigging offshore. Well, I had a contender for a while. So okay, I think that's, that's what you're thinking. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had a contender yeah. for a while. How long did you have that for? I had it for about four years, and it actually sunk at the dock one day. I, I was going to go fishing with Denkert in my boat. We were going to go offshore. The next morning, uh, I went out to dinner, went to get some ice, came back to the dock, and the boat was on its side. And I think what happened was I had had some work done on the boat, and one of the valves, the seacox, was left open in the live well, and it was a it was a live well that actually was kind of in the center, and it, it sunk the boat. Oh. It was it. I remember walking up to the canal, and I saw stuff floating in the water. And I, oh my God, that used to be in my boat, and and it was like somebody gut punched me. It was I didn't I couldn't talk. I was in a state of shock. It was an incredible mm. boat. Yeah, I really loved it. Mm. So I still go offshore. I fish with my brother-in-law most Sundays out of Ocean Reef on his his uh, scout. We go offshore, we jig, we fish on the patches, mm-hmm. and you know really enjoy it. Still. What's your, what's your bone fishing like now for you? Okay, so um, I do not see the fish in Key Largo like I used to see. I see very very few fish there. I, there there is a algae on the bottom on the shoreline of Key Largo between Ocean Reef. And almost to Tavernier, it's a brown algae. So bottom that used to be kind of whitish with hard rock is covered with this stuff. I don't see any box fish. I don't see any crabs. I don't see pinfish. It's become somewhat of a dead zone. So I don't fish bonefish much in Key Largo. I still look. I, I know that there's this thing about the bonefish coming back, and they certainly are coming back in the lower keys. And Isla Mirada has a lot of small fish. So when I bone fish now, I fish the bay, and I would say that the bay has made a nice comeback. There are a decent amount of bonefish on, in the bay. And I fish the lower keys a lot, Sugarloaf Key and, and west of Key West. And there's it, the crazy thing is there places that you, when I was in my, you know, in the 70s and 80s, where you'd go permit fishing out of Key West and you'd see an occasional bonefish, you see a lot of, a lot of bonefish there now. Um, we never used to see a lot there Um but the Lower Keys has a lot of bonefish, not oh, not big ones. You know, if you catch a seven pounder, that's a pretty good fish. Mm-hmm. But I don't really even care anymore. Yeah. What about Biscayne Bay? Biscayne Bay has fish. Yeah, yeah, I see nice fish there. I, I think that there was a twelve pound fish that was, uh, I think, Hansen Lau. I heard about that. Uh, they won the fall fly, I guess it was, and they had a big twelve pound fish or so. Yeah, yeah, that's very encouraging. I mean, the ones that I catch in the bay now are four or five pounds, mm-hmm. um, and you'll see some that look look bigger but i don't see i haven't i'm not going to sit here and say i saw 10 pounders i haven't seen that yeah Mm. but i think you know it depends on where you fish um and i'm kind of old school and i fished on the ocean side like branham i don't spend a lot of time on the west side of the bay i I know guys catch them over there but i i don't really know that all that well right yeah what would you like to add to this conversation that we haven't spoken about I, i would just say that uh you know, in, in my life, um, fishing has been 
my passion pretty much my entire life. I've never played golf. I don't do anything else in terms of hobbies. Um, I travel a little bit with my wife, but my life pretty much has been fishing. Yeah. And it's been a wonderful thing for me. It's kept me, I guess you could say, mentally stable. Maybe right. some people would disagree with that. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's helped my business. I, I built a career around having clients in the fishing world. And I've got to meet a lot of very interesting people like you. Mm -hmm. You. Um, so, you know, fishing has just been a lifesaver. It's an me. incredible family. It, it really it can, is. It, it, there's so much healing powers in fishing. You when, you, when you think about it, there aren't many fishermen. I don't mean fly fishermen. I just mean fishermen, people that fish on a regular basis that aren't pretty nice people. Mm -hmm. You know, you could walk up to a bridge and have somebody standing on that bridge fishing, and they're friendly and they're engaging, you know? Yeah, I get that for sure. That's why we like to gravitate to fishing shops. <laughs> Every time I see a fishing shop, whether it be a fly or a normal tackle shop, it's like, how can you not just step inside and just go look around? Oh, you have to. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm not a f much of a freshwater fisherman, but I can't, I, I do go to Aspen in the summer mm -hmm. for a week or two. And, and I always love going in the fly shops there and I can't help myself. I show them a picture of that 16 pound bone <laughs> fish. Wherever you, you go. Know? <laughs> but uh, I, you know, the last thing I, I would just close with is I, I really do want to say that, you know, um, uh, Thank you to all of the guides that I fished with. You know, we've talked about um, all of them. I, I didn't mench, mention Timmy Klein's name, but Timmy, I, I did win uh, Fall Fly with Timmy. And uh, Randy Tao is an incredible angler. I know you did a podcast with Randy. He's, he's a little bit to me like Ralph Delph. He knows how to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And these, these guides have all had an impact on my life and um, in my world of fishing. And I, I just want to say thank you to them. And Especially thank you to both of you because I'm I'm very humbled and honored that I was invited to do this. Well, you got a great so, story. You've been a great you. friend for so long. Thank you. Uh, from right from the second term, like you know that I ever fished, you were there, and you were kind of like a guiding and a beacon of, of hope and light because you were so engaging, and I was new to the whole thing, and it, it seems like every time I got to the dock, you were there to talk to me. So thank you. Well, I, I genuinely wish you good luck, but I didn't seem like I had to. You were, <laughs> you were so good at this. <laughs> well, I had, a, I had great mentors. I mean, you, you, you. you're like one of the few people I know that you you could go catch a 14-pound bonefish and a 150-pound tarpon on fly, and it, you're good in, in whatever the target is. You're, you're really good at it. Wow. Except I think you're not so good offshore because you get seasick. <laughs> well, just don't let him have a uh, bait caster in his hand. Oh, you'll you'll oh, reverse, oh, reverse oh, everything. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> fine. I can create the world's best bird's nest that you've ever seen. <laughs> but seriously, thank you for this honor. You got it. I you, appreciate you, it very you, much. so great to have you. Thanks, Thanks for telling thank your story. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you got a great thank story. You. Thanks so much. Just thank you. What a so special story. Where so it's just a